You know, I've been around for a while. I've met some interesting people. Done some crazy things. You'd think that there wasn't much that could take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories and science and things that amaze and confound me every single day. Incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night. Some I can answer and others just defy logic. Are man and monster closer than we think? In New Jersey, a woman and her son are attacked by a huge winged creature. He was just frozen in terror. Is it a demon from the 18th century? In South Carolina, a giant lizard-like beast terrorizes a motorist. I wish I knew what was tearing up these cars. Are reptoids from an underground world stalking us? And in Wisconsin, a ravenous and terrifying creature appears on a remote country road. It looked like a large wolf head on top of a really husky, furry body. Was it a werewolf? Yeah, it's a weird world, and I love it. You know, I love being in the woods. At one with nature, there's so many wonderful things to see and hear. Look at, look at this little guy. But sometimes forests can be dark and downright terrifying places, places where you can stumble across things that defy the senses, things that are far more horrific than you could possibly imagine. Lori Winkleman is a mother of three. She lives in southern New Jersey, next to an isolated forest known as the Pine Barrens. It's very unexplored and, and unfriendly, I guess, would be the best description. Lori and her family moved here in 2003. It was then they witnessed the weird and eerie atmosphere of the forest firsthand. There were no squirrels, there were no birds, there was nothing. It was just this quiet, still forest that was very creepy. The family decides to avoid the woods at all costs. But on February 18th, 2004, an event takes place that would haunt them forever. The night stands out in my mind originally because it was the first snowstorm we had down here. Lori ventures outside to turn off the Christmas lights. Her 10-year-old son, Glenn Jr., insists on coming along to help. I had made a buddy system for my kids so that no one was ever allowed to go out alone. As Lori unplugs the lights, she suddenly notices something is very wrong with her little boy. He was just frozen in terror. Lori soon sees why. Someone, or something, is watching them from the forest. It was horrible, it was huge, it had an ugly face, a snout, it had horrible red eyes, little horns, and I just remember it had a horrible bulbous forehead. It was the worst thing I've ever seen. It was just hideous. It also has wings. Terrified, Laurie and her son run for their lives, but the creature takes off in hot pursuit. It swooped over our heads heading in the same direction we were towards the house. When we got to the back door, it was right over us. Scrambling inside, they think they're safe, but whatever attacked them is still out there. There was this like clacky metallic noise on the surface of the roof. I've never heard anything like it. Terrified, Laurie and Glenn huddled together for hours, waiting for the monster to crash through their roof. When they emerge the next morning, the creature is gone. 
but what they see is almost as frightening. We went outside and we saw the, the tracks exactly where it landed. There were footprints, we couldn't believe it, perfect prints. Lori takes photos of the prints. She's determined to solve the mystery, so she shows the evidence to rangers at a nearby state park. I just said, please let me know what this is. Uh, could it be a cougar? Could it be a bear? It's neither. It's something beyond logic. The older gentleman immediately just said, it's the Jersey Devil. You just had a, a Jersey Devil sighting. Well, I was embarrassed, to be honest. I didn't want to scare my neighbors or look like I was insane and seeing Elvis or UFOs. But Laurie and Glenn aren't the only ones. Thousands claim to have seen a demonic-like monster in the Pine Barren. They call it the Jersey Devil. This mysterious entity is believed to have inhabited the forest for over 200 years. Some believe its origins are closely linked to a local witch named Mrs. Leeds, who gave birth to her 13th child in the 18th century. Legend has it, I believe it was deformed, it was horrible, ugly, horrible eyes, snout, horrible forehead. It grew very large and it was very powerful and it broke out and escaped. Was the winged creature that attacked Lori and her son the deformed child of an 18th century witch? I know what I saw and I know animals. I just felt like prey. For the first time in my life, I have never known what it felt like to be prey. And I just felt like that. It was awful. It was just really awful. What exactly stopped Lori and her son? in the woods behind her home. Are demons real? Women's studies professor Deborah McGregor doesn't think the Jersey Devil exists, but she does have a monstrous theory. Monster births were understood to be children of the devil. During the 18th century, some children were born with serious defects due to infectious disease and intermarriage. They were known as monster births. The mother of a monster baby would be damned because some people would say that she had sex with the devil. Professor McGregor claims that not only did Mrs. Leeds suffer a tragic monster birth, but it occurred during a period of Christian fanaticism in New England, which made it seem like a sign that dark, supernatural forces were at work. You might wonder how people got the idea of something being born with claws and horns. I think we don't know. The power of legend amazes me um, in terms of uh, how long this story of the Leeds family should go on. This is from 1735 to 2011. I mean, that's really amazing, someone still remembering that a scene, a sighting of such a creature. People might have thought, well, that's the way a monster looks. Is the Jersey Devil a deformed infant born to an 18th century woman? If so, then how did it turn into the legend of a supernatural creature? It'll keep your kids from going too far, and then maybe they won't get eaten. A woman and her son are attacked by a winged creature in the woods behind their home. Was it a demon from the 18th century? or a legend inspired by a deformed baby. Psychology PhD student Ian Miller agrees the Jersey Devil is a type of monster, one that inhabits our minds. The Jersey Devil is a great example of a meme. According to Miller, a meme is an idea that is transmitted from person to person, infecting our brains much like a virus or a viral video. Memes can describe all sorts of phenomena that we experience on a daily basis, whether it be fashion trends, as a good example, or uh, the adoption of different technologies. Miller thinks memes enable legends to survive for hundreds or even thousands of years. The Jersey Devil is uh, its an example of, I think, an urban legend. And urban legends are great instances of memes. Miller is sure the Jersey Devil meme continues because it serves as a cautionary tale, making the Pine Barrens forest seem scary, even if it isn't. The Jersey Devil, that's a great story that serves a purpose. It'll keep your kids from going too far, and then maybe they won't get eaten. But how did a story of a deformed baby morph into the legend of the Jersey Devil? 
To demonstrate, Miller has set up an experiment to show how a meme works in real time. What we're going to try today is uh, we're going to revisit a game that we might have played when we were younger called Broken Telephone. A volunteer is shown an image of the Jersey Devil. She in turn describes what she's seen to the next person and so on down the line. Through word of mouth, the idea evolves, becoming more fantastical each time it's retold. I expect that a lot of the details about this picture are gonna be completely lost. Uh, you know, is this monster eating an animal or is it eating a person? The way that the, the Jersey Devil is depicted in this image um, has uh, definitely some horror influence to it. It's gonna be a kind of scary picture. And I'm expecting that that's a component of the story that might well be repeated as we go down the chain. By the end, the meme has become virtually unrecognizable from the original illustration. Moment of truth, what do we got? A wolf jumping on a nail in the forest. A wolf jumping on a nail. If even one person along the chain misremembers something, these alterations to the story are just gonna kind of explode. Here's what we got. <laughs> I think it definitely illustrated the point that when one person tells another person, they're not making an identical copy of whatever was in the first person's head. Psychology professor Doug Canlan agrees Lori Winkleman and her son saw something strange and frightening. But it wasn't a demon. It was a human child. Since the founding of Rome, there have been stories about human beings who've been raised by animals. They're called feral children. And they're surprisingly common. Over 400 of these bizarre cases have been documented worldwide. In one case, the famous wolf girls of India, the girls actually grabbed birds and ate them raw. But where do they come from? Is modern civilization creating wild, animal-like creatures that survive purely on primal instincts? Historically, of course, the reason is that parents or guardians realize that they have a child who is not intellectually capable. They have inherited a real problem that's going to cost them their livelihood. The easiest thing is to leave them for nature to take care of. How would you know a feral child if you see one on the street? Well, uh, you would find if you should chat with the person that they had difficulty understanding you and certainly you had a difficulty understanding them. Uh, they probably would not have had a haircut or done their hair or had fingernails. They would be interested in knowing whether you had any food with you. Uh, and their clothing, if any, uh, would be in tatters. Wow, this story is getting more and more monstrous by the minute. First, it's some witch having sex with the devil. Oh, now this other guy actually believes that sweet, innocent children could become horrifying monsters. Is he crazy? <laughs> hey, 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 no playing ball. Get off my lawn. I don't think he's crazy at all. Could Lori Winter really have mistaken a feral human child for a hideous monster? Professor Candan says yes, thanks to the atmosphere of fear and terror inspired by the Pine Barrens. If you're living in a place and you hear something out there every night, you're already primed to be frightened. Candlin feels creepy environments make people think they're dealing with something much worse than it really is. This leads to belief that uh, one is dealing with a subhuman sort of beast who's apt to be dangerous. In point of fact, they're rarely dangerous. So was the Jersey Devil a feral child roaming the forest? Or was it a deformed infant born to an 18th century woman? Or is the mystery of the creature only in our minds? We may never know. But we are know what. A small town in South Carolina 
is terrorized by a strange lizard creature. We didn't know what we was up against. Man beasts. Throughout history, we've heard of mythical creatures that are somehow part human, part animal. Oh, wow. Now, let's assume for a minute that they do exist. It might be possible, right? This throws up some very interesting questions. If they are half and half, which is which? <laughs> are they animals with the brains of humans or humans with the brains of animals? And what do we prefer? Are man beasts living among us? And if they are, would you want to live alongside a cold blooded being whose emotions and thoughts are completely alien? In the summer of 1988, Liston Truesdale was the sheriff of Bishopville, South Carolina. This kind of is a sleepy little community. But things soon began to change. In a bizarre series of incidents, someone or something began attacking parked cars. But these were no ordinary acts of vandalism. The cars looked as though they had bite marks. This was a very serious situation that uh, attacked in cars, and, and we didn't know what we had. We didn't know where it was something that escaped from a circus truck or, or somebody's pet. A bear or what it could have been. We, we didn't know. And we just had to find out the best way we could. I wish I knew what was tearing up these cars. We didn't know what we was up against. Listen would soon find out when one night, a terrified high school student named Chris Davis shows up at his police station. Chris Davis was a, a kid, a 17-year-old boy at the time. And he started telling me, what had happened to him. I couldn't believe what I was listening to. Chris Davis had a flat tire. He stopped to fix his flat tire side of the road. He finished fixing the tire, put his tools in the car, and looked across the road. Davis can't comprehend what he sees. A gigantic green creature is watching him from the forest. It was a huge, what he described as seven feet tall or more, with big red eyes, looked to be a greenish in color, but he really didn't know, and had three fingers. Whatever it was scared the hell out of him. The creature begins running towards him. Chris Davis jumped in his car and slammed the door quick and sped off like a bat out of hell. But the creature isn't giving up so easily. The creature jumped on the trunk of the car and then onto the top of the car and was looking down at him through the windshield from the top. Davis swerves the car, trying to dislodge it. He thinks he threw him off. He had to throw him off. Mystified, Sheriff Truesdale doesn't know what to make of the story. I said, draw it. So he drew it. Truesdale is stunned by the picture. It shows a lizard-like being that stands upright like a human. And it wasn't anything like I ever seen. But Sheriff Truesdale needs to know if Davis is telling the truth. We asked him if um, he would submit to a, a lie detector test. No problem, he said. Davis passes the test. He isn't lying. But what had he seen? Davis's testimony isn't the only report. Soon dozens of others come forward to describe their encounters with a giant lizard-like creature. But not everyone is convinced. Well, a lot of people didn't believe it, and a lot of people thought it was a hoax. Crop duster pilot Frank Mitchell knows it's no hoax. Why? He saw it too. 
The morning of deciding uh, was a nice day. I got up with a very clear mind, happy as a lark. Fixed my coffee like I always do, lit my cigarette, and uh, loaded the airplane as usual, and uh, taxied on out to the runway. Mitchell brings his plane up to takeoff speed. Here, here I am coming 75 miles an hour, ready to take off. Suddenly, he sees something that turns his blood cold. This thing come out about right where I'm standing and just simply walked right across this runway, right in front of the airplane. This thing was eight or nine feet tall, or better. Looked like a big monkey, maybe, with a, a lar larger nose, maybe, than a monkey would have, much taller and a brownish, greenish looking skin. It, it had a lope in its walk, and it didn't run, it just walked across the runway. It's too late to abort takeoff, so Mitchell keeps going. But as soon as he's in the air, the creature disappears in forest. I come back around as quick as I could, but I never did see it again. And I didn't say anything about it. Then, a few days later, my buddy said, Frank, I hear a racket in the woods out here. So I took the shotgun and walked out with him, and my wife followed me. And right under that light, she got a, a, a bit by a rattlesnake. The next day, after I carried her to the hospital, which she came out fairly OK, um, behind me here, there was a whole lot of damage in the woods back here, but I had no idea what did it, All right, unless it was what I had seen just a few days before. Mitchell is convinced that the thing he saw is still up there. I still hear a strange sound to this day that I cannot describe to you. I used to walk almost to the swamp at night, but I don't go anymore at night, period. Uh, this property right here, I have loved all the, uh, ever since I've been here. However, now I'm curious about it at night, you know, but I do love this property, but there is something out here somewhere in these woods around that swamp. It's a long swamp, and uh, he may not be on this property right now, but it's a long swamp, and he can be anywhere, and I promise you, he is somewhere. Did Mitchell see the same animal that terrified Chris Davis? Was it a lizard man? Whatever it was, he's taking no chances. I promise you I wouldn't come out here without my gun and a good flashlight. Could so many witnesses be wrong? What is living in the swamps of South Carolina? Crypto hunter John Rhodes has a theory so weird, if true, it would change the history of evolution. The lizard man of Bishopville he evolved here. He continues to live here just like we do. It's just that we don't get to see these guys very often. It's a wild idea. The lizard man is not half human, but a creature that has evolved alongside of us, a human-like reptile known as a reptoid. A reptoid is a, a is a combinative word of reptilian and humanoid. And a, rept a reptoid is actually a being that has been looked at as being seven, seven and a half feet tall. Uh, it's large, very muscular build, large chest. It's got a hand with uh, an opposable thumb and large, three large fingers with claws. They don't seem to have any ears. There's no hair on the body. The eyes are very large and almond looking with vertical slit pupils. They have two slits for a nose, and their lips and their jawline is very strong, and their lips are, or their mouth has no lips. It's lipless. And um, these beings are very su uh, imposing when you're looking at them because you feel that there's just no chance to outrun them or to get away or anything like that. So it's a terrifying event to meet one for the first time. Reptoids evolved naturally on Earth through the lineage of reptiles or the dinosaurs, most likely the dinosaurs. We do actually have scientific evidence that supports this kind of conjecture. There was a scientist by the name of Dale Russell who worked with the Museum of Natural Sciences in Ottawa, Canada, and he was asked by NASA to speculate what extraterrestrial life would look like should we encounter it. And what he did was he took a dinosaur that was alive 65 million years ago named Truodon, and based on its fossil records, he was able to morphologically um, look forward in time past the point of where they died out to see exactly what they would have looked like later on down the line in history. 
And the model he, he came up with was strikingly similar to those reported by people like in Bishopville, South Carolina or across the United States, but also historically, because the historical records are filled with serpent-like beings or anthropological serpent-like beings who have the ability to talk to humans. Rhodes thinks this points to an astonishing conclusion, that the dinosaurs never actually died out, and may even have evolved in similar ways to human beings. There's potential for a convergent evolution between mammals and what we would think of as dinosaurs. To support his case, Rhodes claims the reptoid's ancestor was an unusually smart dinosaur called the true Odo. It was intelligent. It had a large brain case. Its eyes were actually coming from the side of its head towards the front of its face to allow it to have stereoscopic vision. It made a better hunter. Could a supposedly extinct dinosaur have evolved into the creature they call the lizard man? Here's what the lizard man might look like, a artist's conception of a modern day true this illustration is actually very similar to those descriptions provided by the individuals who have cited the lizard man in Bishopville. Did Chris Davis encounter a reptoid evolved from a dinosaur? Rhodes believed not only do reptoids exist with an intelligence to rival ours, but they are living right under our feet. From the research that we've done, it appears that reptilian humanoids and their small populations live in geologically remote areas underground with technology just like we have on the planet. Are they more advanced than us? That's somewhat questionable. If they have evolved longer than us, I would say that's definite. Is an advanced reptoid civilization living somewhere deep inside the Earth? Rhodes realizes his theory sounds far-fetched. Keep in mind, as fantastic as this sounds, scientists know we've only cataloged about 4% of all life on Earth. That means that there's anywhere from 100 to 200 million life forms on our planet we haven't even seen and cataloged yet. Could dinosaurs have survived all these years and evolved hidden from view? Or could there be another explanation? There's many things in the environment that can cause mutations. A strange creature terrorizes the town of Bishopville, South Carolina. Is it half man, half lizard? Shannon Bard, professor of environmental toxicology at Dalhousie University, doesn't think the lizard man is an evolved dinosaur. She raises an even more bizarre possibility, that the creature could be a normal reptile mutated into a monster by toxic chemicals. There's many things in the environment that can cause mutations. There can be different chemicals in the environment which can interact at a cellular level and actually cause the DNA to get uh, breaks in it, and that causes a mutation. These could be generated um, at an industrial site or at a hazardous waste site and could accidentally be um, introduced into the environment and you could get exposure that way. So different chemicals in industrial processes, um, different drugs can be very potent. Um, and uh, there are also situations in which a chemical itself or a drug itself may not act as a mutagen itself, but it may disrupt cellular function in such a way that a mutation actually occurs. There's damage to the cell, and it causes stress in the cell, and then a mutation results as a secondary effect. Sometimes these mutations can create giants. There are many f factors involved in, um, in producing animals that may be growing larger or stronger than their, their parents. They could potentially have some mutations in their genes, which would increase the level of growth hormones. But if the lizard man is a mutant monster, how did it become one? Guess what? A toxic waste dump was located right near Bishopville at the time of the Lizard Man sightings. Very poor areas or remote areas uh, were selected for hazardous waste dumps, areas that weren't being used. And um, many years ago, we weren't aware of the fact that many of the chemicals could be leaching from these um, disposal sites uh, into the environment where animals could be exposed to them. In this particular site, there was discharge of the waste into surrounding water bodies. And so you could have a situation in which mutagens would enter into the aquatic environment and different organisms living there could potentially be exposed. <sighs> Strange creatures emerging from toxic waste dumps, transformed from cute little critters 
It's a giant mutant beast that terrified the planet. Ridiculous, isn't it? Well, I gotta tell you, I don't think it is. I've had some very serious issues with my plumbing lately. And if whatever it is living in there escapes, all of us, all of us are doomed. Could the lizard man be a giant rampaging mutant? Ben Radford is the deputy editor of the Skeptical Inquirer magazine. I'm investigating the lizard man as, for example, a homicide detective would investigate a murder. You look at eyewitnesses, you look at forensic evidence. He thinks there's less to the lizard man phenomenon than meets the eye. You see the same thing with a lot of, a lot of these sort of mysterious monsters. You don't have direct evidence of these things. You, you have very, very few eyewitness sightings. Why? Simple. Radford claims people invoke the lizard man whenever something unusual happens in Bishopville. People aren't saying, I saw the lizard man. People are saying, this is weird. What could it be? Oh, there's a lizard man <laughs> down the road. That must be it. It's an interesting uh, psychological phenomena where people, they attribute things that they can't explain to monsters. But Radford is certain what really drives the lizard man stories is money. Of course, the lizard man has been an economic boom for Bishopville and elsewhere, uh, people cashing in on it. Then there's the lizard man merchandise. We have, of course, uh, a, a bumper sticker. Who doesn't need that on your minivan? Lizard man butter beans. I have no idea what this is. It's uh, not for human consumption, I do know that. Dun 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 dun, the Lizard Man t-shirts. Not just one, mind you, we've, we've got a whole bunch of them. We also got another Lizard Man shirt. Does this mean that the Lizard Man is a hoax and everyone in Bishopville is in on the joke? Not necessarily. Yeah, I think it began as a hoax, uh, but then after that came misunderstandings, misperceptions, uh, people who were like, well, something damaged my car, must be the Lizard Man. Well, no, <laughs> it could be any number of things, not necessarily the Lizard Man. If it is a hoax, how do we explain Christopher Davis? Didn't he pass a lie detector test? I tried to track down the polygraph test. I couldn't find anyone who would give me any, any information on it. I'm not saying he didn't. I'm just saying if he did, then where's the evidence for it? And again, if the Lizard Man doesn't exist, how does he account for all the cars damaged by the creature? I've seen the photos and I'm not impressed. <laughs> it's clear that, that, that Whatever these marks are, they're not bite marks, period. End of story. To my mind, the most compelling evidence for the Lizard Man is probably Dixie Rawson's minivan. Uh, her story is that she came out one morning, uh, actually I think her husband did, Robert, and he saw these, these weird scratches and holes in the front grill of, of their Dodge minivan. And um, we're like, what's going on here? What, what caused these, this damage to, to the car? And uh, it, it actually wasn't Dixie or her husband that originally came up with the idea that the lizard man had attacked it. It was actually her neighbors. She told her neighbors, like, well, th isn't this weird? Her neighbors like, that must be caused by the lizard man. And then she's like, oh, okay. And she'd never heard of the story before. And so she basically adopted the, she basically believed what they said. And, you know, if her neighbors are telling her that it's a lizard man, maybe it's a lizard man, who knows? What's interesting about it is that her husband actually didn't believe that. Her husband uh, thought that it was caused by uh, a bear. Radford has a simple explanation, vandalism. And he thinks he can prove it. At a junkyard outside Albuquerque, New Mexico, Radford will test his theory. Radford believes he can replicate the so-called lizard man damage using common household items. I have a variety of tools I'm going to use, including a, a pellet gun, I have a hammer, uh, a pickaxe, a saw. Is it vandalism or, or teeth marks from Lizard Man? Let's find out. This is an attempt to bring some science to it. This gets beyond eyewitness sightings, beyond the reports, to real physical evidence. Finally, Bradbury gets the results he's looking for. I had a lot of success with one of the, the screwdrivers that makes holes that look pretty much exactly like the, the teeth marks. My guess is that it wasn't a lizard man that attacked the vehicle, it was a screwdriver. Is the lizard man of Bishop an intelligent reptoid descended from dinosaurs? Is it a mutant lizard born in a toxic waste dump? Or is it a hoax 
designed to boost the local economy and cover up for vandals. Weird. Or what? A man is attacked by a terrifying and bloodthirsty creature in Elkhorn, Wisconsin. Was it a werewolf? I have never seen an animal that ever looked like that. Dogs. Man's best friend. Take Fluffy here, for example. Even though he eats me out of house and home, I'd die for this guy. I love him. He gives me companionship, protection. Well, Maybe not so much protection, but so much love. Really, I couldn't live without him. But what if under this harmless exterior, what if there's something evil inside? What if Fluffy isn't a dog at all, but half dog, half human? Yes, you heard me right. What if your lovely pet was a werewolf that could rip you apart? You might feel different, right? Do werewolves exist? Impossible? Maybe not. Oh my god, this is horrible. You need a bath, young man. Elkhorn, Wisconsin. Stephen Kruger works for the local Department of Natural Resources. His job? Collecting deer carcasses from the highway at night. I'd always pick up at night and grab the deer bring them back in the morning to the landfill, to the local landfill, and dump them off. But on the night of November 8th, 2006, Stephen came across something else, something so weird, it burned into his memory. I was out traveling, doing my normal DNR deer pickup, and there was a deer I came across on Holy Hill Road that was not on the scheduled pickup list. He stops to check the animal. It was about an 80 pound deer, a doll. They threw down the tailgate, tossed it in the back of the truck. We had to go back in the cab to fill out the paperwork to be able to take the deer properly. But this routine job is about to become a nightmare. Suddenly, Stephen feels the truck shudder. Didn't phase me at first. I thought it might have been the wind or something. And then it shook more vigorously the second time. Uh, I looked in the rear view mirror and there it was. What he sees makes no sense. Something bizarre is climbing onto his truck. I just saw it from the head to the shoulders, a little bit below, below the shoulders. It looked like it was reaching into the truck to grab, and which I'm only assuming was the deer that I just put in there. What could be strong enough to carry out the 36 kilogram deer? It looked like a large wolf head on top of a really husky, furry body. It was something I never have ever seen before, and I've seen pretty much every animal that I thought was in the state of Wisconsin, from bear to wolves to coyotes. But Stephen's confusion is about to turn to terror. As he watches, the creature stands on its two hind legs, like a man. I guessed it to be around six and a half to seven feet tall. It could have been a very large wolf on its hind legs. I've never seen that before. Stared at it for about, I don't even know if it was five seconds, might even be too long. I threw the truck into drive because it scared the living daylights on me and I hit the gas. Stephen thinks he's safe until he hears something strange. I did hear the clunk of the ramp hitting the ground. I, that was a distinctive metal hitting the pavement type of sound. Somehow, the animal has pulled the deer and the heavy metal ramp right off his truck. Despite his fear, he decides he must go back. I did need to go back and get the ramp because that was a vital part of my job. On the heavier deer, I can't pick up a 180 pound deer on my own. Stephen returns to the scene, but the creature has vanished. When I got back to the area, I just grabbed my flashlight and the ramp, the deer, everything was gone. Uh, did not find anything. Whatever it was, was strong enough to drag the deer and the ramp off into the woods. 
Frightened and confused, Stephen heads straight to the police. I figured it was an aggressive animal, whatever it was, uh, so I decided to stop in at the Washington County Sheriff's Department and report the incident. Stephen recounts his weird encounter, but remarkably, the police aren't surprised. They've heard the story before. The creature even has a name. They call it the Bray Road Beast. The mysterious animal has been sighted hundreds of times, going back at least three decades. They did take me serious on it. They did send out two squads to take a look for it, but they did not find anything either. What did Steven Kruger see? What animal stands like a human and has super strength? Could this be evidence that werewolves exist? I have never seen an animal that ever looked like that. Uh, I don't think I ever will see another animal that looks like that, to be honest. You know, of all the things in the human psyche, a werewolf is one of the most terrifying. I mean, just look how ugly this guy is. But actually coming into contact with one, now that's scary. What do you do? Well, you know, you use one of these. And do silver bullets really work? Well, perhaps you'd use one of these. I hope you didn't think I meant that ugly crap. Folklorist James Lauder is an expert on werewolves. He says they are more myth than monster. There have always been stories about uh, people transforming into animals. That can go, you can go back and look at the myths. In Christian theology and in Christian writings, they represent humankind falling into the control of Satan. No one can run from the werewolves. But if werewolves don't exist, why did we invent them? Because they enable us to cope with the darkest sides of our nature. It's a manifestation of the dual nature of humanity. So you can seem like a good person at one point, and you can do horrible things in another instance. The werewolf allows people to deal with the anxiety that anyone is capable of doing horrible things. Horror allows people to confront things in their lives that, that make them uncomfortable or that, uh, that cause them stress or anxiety. And it's not surprising that horror is so successful now. Everyday life is incredibly stressful for a lot of people for all kinds of reasons. But when they view a horror movie or they read a horror story, it allows them to confront those fears, confront those anxieties, and it, it hopefully dismiss them then at the end or at least feel better about their situation. But if this is true, what did Steve Kruger see? Was it just a trick of his mind? Louder has another compelling theory. He's uh, somebody who's been a hunter. He's, as a contractor for the DNR, he's seen animal bodies. He knows what they look like. He recognized that it was something that he didn't understand what it was and that it was an animal. But what animal fits the description given by Steve Kruger? and hundreds of others who have come into contact with the Bray Road Beast. Normally, we get the gray wolf, is the typical kind of, of wolf we see in the state. Uh, more recently, environmentalists have found that uh, there are eastern wolves that have moved into the area. Could two species of wolves be breeding, creating a new hybrid creature? It, it's certainly possible that there are species in the area that people haven't identified. It certainly could have been uh, a species of wolf that he hadn't seen before, or some kind of animal that is a, a, a hybrid. Is the Bray Road Beast a new, frightening species of super wolf? Or is the explanation even weaker? Researcher Phil Dingra has a mind-blowing idea. Sightings like this are evidence of an incredible evolutionary leap. Wolves that have evolved to walk on two legs. It's very much possible that what people saw are animals that are exhibiting bipedal behavior. Could be a wolf, could be a bear, could be something else. Bipedalism isn't actually that hard. Dingra claims wolves could have become bipedal through a natural process. Punctuated equilibrium is the idea that rapid changes in evolution can happen in a short period of time. 
But why would wolves want to walk like us? We trap their rabbits, we kill their deer, and we have read about wolves declining population. Eventually they're gonna go extinct. Dingra believes wolves are being forced to evolve in order to survive. The ability to stand upright can give animals an edge, especially when it comes to scaring off competitors. There's many advantages to walking on two legs. I think the ones that are commonly cited for why humans found it advantageous to walk on two legs is that in the savannas when the, all the vegetation was um, getting scarce, they were able to see above the horizon to look for other places for food. So that's, that's called the visibility hypothesis. Um, another advantage to standing on two legs is uh, for display. It's called the display hypothesis. This is about threatening other rivals. If you stand up, you are taller, you are larger, you are more threatening. If true, the Bray Road Beast would be in good company. All kinds of animals, from birds to kangaroos, have evolved to become bipedal. What we have to really think about is that all of the features of the Bray Road Beast, none of these things are exotic. It is a creature that is straight out of the animal family, animal kingdom. Did Stephen Kruger and hundreds of others see a wolf that has learned to walk on two feet? And if so, why hasn't it been caught? It's some sort of other dimensional manifestation. A terrifying creature attacks Stephen Kruger's truck in the lowland Wisconsin. Was it a werewolf? Or a wolf that learned to walk like a man? Paranormal phenomena expert Linda Godfrey apparently has the answer. She was a reporter on the scene when the first Bray Road Beast sightings began in 1991. To my surprise, when I began to investigate, I found out that there was a wide variety of witnesses. None of them seemed to have anything to gain by lying, or, and most of them were genuinely frightened by what they had seen. These eyewitnesses described a beast much like the one that attacked Stephen Kruger's truck. They were seeing a creature that stood five to seven feet tall, looked like an upright wolf running or walking on its hind legs. Godfrey's investigation led her to a startling revelation. The creature is in front of this one. It's some sort of other dimensional manifestation similar to the Native American concept of spirit creatures that cross back and forth from a spirit world to ours. Does the Bray Road Beast travel at will between our reality and another beyond? Yes, says Godfrey, and here's how. They use ancient Native American religious sites as portals to the spirit world. They're called effigy mounds, man-made piles of earth in the shape of animals, and Wisconsin has more of them than anywhere in the world. They represented different facets of the animal kingdom, from water creatures to land creatures to air creatures. The people who built the effigy mounds, their shamans were able to bring forth spirits that would guard the mound. Could this be true? Well, think about this. Most sightings of the Bray Road Beast have taken place in or around effigy mounds. Is the creature somehow using ancient religious sites as a gateway from another dimension? But it just is very odd that the hot spots of dogman sightings are all very close to these concentrations of certain types of effigy mound. I discovered almost accidentally that concentrations of a certain type of effigy mound that have a very long tail and are either called the panther, lizard, or water spirit mound correspond almost exactly with hotspot um, sightings areas of the dogman. I don't pretend to fully understand it, and I hope someday that I figure out a little bit more about it. Was the creature that terrified Stephen Kruger a supernatural being from another world? Is the Bray Road Beast a wolf that evolved to walk on two legs? Or are werewolves real and living in Wisconsin? Whatever the truth, this story is most definitely weird, or what? So there we have it. 
Three stories of mysterious creatures that seem to be half man, half beast. A winged demon suggests an 18th century legend is true. Does the Jersey Devil really exist? A lizard man terrorizes residents of a South Carolina community. Is it a highly evolved dinosaur? A giant wolf-like creature is repeatedly seen in Wisconsin. Is the Bray Road Beast a real-life werewolf? You decide. Join me next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be weird or what? <laughs>